and welcome to Regenerative Rising's podcast, Elevating Stories, Activating Change. I am your host, Nisha Mary Paulos, Executive Director of Regenerative Rising. And with me today is Graham Boyd, CEO and founder of Evolute 6. Graham is an entrepreneur and a business consultant to other entrepreneurs and specializes in the transformation of businesses into net positive regenerative ecosystems. His unique background as a physicist and his ex- expertise in conscious capitalism is an exciting combination that I can't wait to explore today. He's also an author of two books, Rebuild, The Economy, Leadership, and You, The Ergodic Investor and Entrepreneur. We will come to those books as well today. He combines research methodology and his vast business experience to support the holistic transformation of both startups and established organizations into regenerative beings. Thank you so much for speaking to us today, Graham. I'm looking forward to our conversation very much. Thank you, Nisha. And likewise, I'm excited about this conversation and very much looking forward to it. Uh, uh, by way of starting, um, maybe you could just like uh, give us a quick introduction of yourself and your background and a little bit about Evolute 6 as well. Yes, gladly, gladly. And I'll, I'll tee up something that we'll come back to. If we look at conscious capitalism and we say, well, if we take conscious capitalism really, really seriously, what does the conscious mean? What does consciousness mean for a company if a company is part of conscious capitalism? So that was a question that I started asking myself in, in various phrasings of that about 10, 15 years ago, more 15 years rather than 10. And I got there because of the path I followed through life. So I was born in Zimbabwe, a um, small village called Rhodesia. Uh, sorry, a small village called Rusapi. Um, at that stage, Zimbabwe was Rhodesia. My mom is English. My dad's South African. They met there and then moved to South Africa when I was two. So I grew up in apartheid South Africa, embedded in a deeply unjust system that I knew was unjust. But as a child, uh, there wasn't much that I could see that I could viably do to change the entire system. My, a very big part of growing up in South Africa for me was I... I really enjoyed physics. I enjoyed trying to understand how do things work. And so physics was the first discipline that I dived into to figure out how does everything work. And I ended up studying particle physics through to PhD level. And a big part of my research work then led on to the book that we published at the end of last month, so just seven days ago, The Ergodic Investor and Entrepreneur, the whole question of ergodicity was at the center of my research as a physicist. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a bit of an idea of where I started. And the threads of apartheid and particle physics and ergodicity, I left behind me. After a research career in academia of about 10 years in Germany, Italy, and Japan, joined Procter & Gamble in part because it's a company that is a for-purpose company to improve the lives of the world's consumers. And I thought, yes, this is the right place for me to be to work on things that will really improve life. And by the mid-2000s, at that stage, I was based in Beijing as part of the leadership team building the operation there. I'd lived through SARS coronavirus 1 in 2002, the pollution of Beijing, all kinds of other things, the oil price hitting $150 a barrel towards the, the end of my time in China. plus. 
it w- had become really clear to me what I'd been reading about as a physics student, limits to growth, the climate ch- crisis that was coming, all of these things. It was clear to me by the early 2000s that we were already in the climate crisis. The final stage of collapse had already begun, just a little bit like um, in Roadrunner, where you've run off the edge of the cliff and you keep going in a straight line in the cartoon because gravity hasn't quite realized you're no longer supported by the ground. You know, humanity is in that stage um, and was very much in that stage in the early 2000s. We were already over the edge of the cliff, but people hadn't yet realized that gravity was starting to pull them down and thought we could just keep going straight. And I realized that P&G was trapped in the same system as all of the other companies, and that this was a big reason why P&G was, whilst everybody was doing their best, companies like P&G, Unilever, all of the others, couldn't get, do anywhere near as much as they would like to because of how they were structured, which brought me back to particle physics, brought me back to ergodicity, brought me back to apartheid, and brought me to the question of what really is a conscious company in a conscious regenerative circular capitalism and what needs to be true to build that kind of company? So I, I will pause there. Where, where would you like to go next? Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, I think, I guess I'd like to talk a little bit more about, um, if that's just um, your, your experience, which has brought you to this point in space and time, spans this very... Um, intuitive understanding of inequality, which you experienced living in apartheid um, South Africa, all the way to working in a huge multinational corporate, working with investors, working with startups today, uh, writing a book, working. I mean, I imagine the world of physics and the world of business are so different in how people think and, and interact with each other, even on a daily basis in these setups. And um, I want to uh, ask you, because that was your starting point, your experience or and witnessing the kind of inequality that apartheid and the post-colonial reality of South Africa um, that and what it has all led to. How did how did that really um, create this idea of a more conscious uh, business system? And how do, how do you see business as a way to, uh, to combat these inequalities and injustices? And where is the role of consciousness in business itself? Yes, yeah. yes. So in terms of the role of business to combat these inequalities, I'm very much guided by a, a quote, and the, the origin of the quote escapes me for the moment, but the dominant institution in any era is accountable for the good of the whole. And if I look on the planet today, the institution of business I would argue is the dominant institution on the planet. We're deep in the Anthropocene. You know, the, the geology of the planet is now visibly shaped by human activity. And human activity at that scale is basically business, small and big. So I think that business, business has to step up and really address systemic injustices. And if I, part of my inspiration, as I've said, is, is drawing on, on the experiences in apartheid South Africa. You know, and it, it was very clear to me in apartheid South Africa, I was one of the lucky ones. You know, and, and I emphasize the word luck. There's nothing that I did 
that meant that I deserved to be born with a white skin. But the luck of being born me with a white skin meant that I was included in a whole range of things that most of the South African population was systemically excluded from. And that many of the people who are listening to this may know the Southern African philosophical tradition of Ubuntu, which you can loosely paraphrase as, I am because you are. And if you extrapolate that, it says, I am also because of the system that I'm embedded in. And part of the, the miracle of the transition out of apartheid, which in some senses went far better than anybody had any right to expect, lay in the recognition that we were all embedded in this apartheid system of systemic injustice, systemic inclusion or exclusion. And that meant that the range of roles that any individual could play was shaped by the system rather than just by themselves. And so if you think now of consciousness, this is analogous to saying the consciousness that can express itself is shaped by the structures that the scaffolding that supports that consciousness, the kinds of interactions that are possible. And so if you think very, you know, the, at its simplest essence, the iniquities of apartheid came down to a, have a root in a very simple systemic thing. If from pure luck, you happen to be born with a white skin, you had the right to vote, which meant you had control of how the country evolved and control of how the wealth was distributed. And it struck me about 13 years ago that we build businesses more or less the same way. If you have money to invest, you have voting rights in the shareholder meeting, you have control of the company and control of how the wealth is distributed. And it struck me that the essence of the two has so much in parallel that to really enable South Africa as a nation to even begin to go onto the journey towards what it could be, could towards be. its full potential, and to even begin to go onto a journey to address all of the systemic injustices, the first requirement was that all of the citizens had voting rights. Because without the voting rights and without the power to defend your voting rights, the power to engage in governance, everything else is highly fragile and subjected, subject to the benevolence of whoever has power. And it struck me, hang on, if we want to build a regenerative economy, circular economy, whatever, 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 we need to build companies where all of the capitals are at the table in the shareholder meetings, represented by all of the stakeholders, including stakeholders representing, say, the next seven generations, and stakeholders representing the planet, as well as stakeholders potentially as appropriate for whatever the company is there for, stakeholders that may represent the suppliers, the customers, the staff, um, perhaps the city that the factory is embedded in, maybe even stakeholders representing the national population as a whole. And this comes back to the question of, well, what is a conscious company and conscious capitalism? You know, if I think of what is it in my perspective that makes my brain conscious, it's not having one awesomely powerful brain cell that occupies my entire brain. 
it's having a huge range of brain cells with different functions, different roles. They're in a constant war with each other within my brain for attention. But all of them are strongly interconnected with each other. And all of them have an appropriate balance of governance rights on what happens in my brain. You know, if, if that part of my brain that is connected to my little finger detects a knife slicing into my finger, that part of my brain will take over my whole body and you know, get my body away from the knife. And it struck me, this is what a conscious company needs to be, that we take really seriously that a company is a community of human beings as well as a, a productive entity. We take really seriously the idea of um, uh, what would I'm of group intelligence, community intelligence, that kind of thing, and start to see companies as a community of people that has intelligence consciousness as a community as a whole, and that this consciousness doesn't necessarily have a fixed boundary. It, it in, needs to include in the interactions, in the governance, representatives of all capitals, all stakeholders, that only if you do that can you truly build a conscious capitalism. In other words, conscious capitalism is more about consciousness and less about capitalism. Yeah. Oh, wow. There's just so much to unpack there. But I just want to say that all that you're sharing ha is really inspiring and kind of enlightening as well, because, you know, this seems some of these things which actually feels like, oh, it should be so such, such a natural thought, but it isn't. Um, that isn't how any of it is set up. And as you just so rightly said, like when you were talking about apartheid is um, how business is set up like that. And that's, you know, because businesses of today and that the whole foundation of the system itself was born out of colonialism, which was born out of the idea of extracting and profit over everything else. Um, and so, so, and that, you know, then and then when we understand that this is the root of the current business system and, and the root of the current understanding of capitalism itself, we also see why that problem is so pervasive um, across the world. Uh, and so I, I want to uh, speak a little bit more about, um, you know, so so we are now set up in this system where uh, profit is the most important aspect and many companies are really just chasing the the bottom line um and regardless of uh of where in the world they are this has become the norm now but on the other hand we do have a lot of organizations um and a lot of those are organizations we've also worked with as you know as regenerative rising who really truly want to use business as a vehicle for change so I'm just curious to understand, um, so if this is the scaffolding that is holding up the system today, how do we go from here um, to, to a system that, I, I just really love the way you put that across, that um, who are the stakeholders of the business and how can all of them have governing rights? Like we often talk about the supply chains, right? And when we're talking about regeneration, um, that is a big conversation about where something is produced or growing and what happens there uh, and along the entire chain. But if everybody, um, and human and non-human, was part of the um, of the of the governing board and had a vote, how would that look like? So. In your uh, wisdom and in your perspective and research, how does this, how do you see this as a, um, how can this practically be understood by someone who's really interested in creating this transformation? Yes. Beautiful question. So taking steps on this journey to transformation is what we've been up to in Evolute 6 well, 
in various guises since I left PNG 15 years ago. And we've developed a number of elements to making this transformation. Think of them perhaps as, as the three pillars of the bridge that connects where we are now with where we need to get to. And one of those key pillars links together consciousness and property. Whether we treat something as a thing that we can own, buy, and sell, or we treat it as something that is inherently free, inherently itself. And if you think of nature, nature is incredibly successful, has been incredibly successful since life started on the planet at steadily increasing the capacity of the planet to support life. So let's hold that in mind for, for the rest of our conversation, that profit in nature is there to increase the capacity of the planet to carry life. And I think this is something that's really important not to lose. Profit itself can be hugely supportive to us so long as we think of it in terms of the bigger picture of how do we increase the capacity of the planet to support life. And the business is a way that we can use as humans to increase the capacity of the planet to support life, not decrease it. And that's exactly what we mean when we talk about net positive business, regenerative business, all of these things, it's about increasing the capacity across all of the capitals to support life. Now, for me, this comes right back at its root level to the question of what can we treat as a thing versus what ought we never treat as a thing. And it's, you know, it's now pretty clear around the world that we really oughtn't to treat human beings as things. You know, human beings really ought to be fully free, and fully free includes the, the tools, the resources, the capacity to define your own identity, to... Um, to make the most of your potential. You know, that, that's freedom. Equally, we really ought not be treating life as a whole as a thing that we can apply the concepts of property to. And the big eye-opener for me about 12, 13 years ago was when it suddenly struck me, hang on, if we take really seriously the idea of a company as a conscious entity, if we take the concept of collective intelligence really seriously, then we ought to build companies as a free commons, not as a thing that we try to own. And I very quickly, after diving into that, discovered, hang on, that is actually how a company is defined. In legal systems around the world, companies, the, the whole meaning of the word incorporation is declaring it to be a person. And if you look in the writings of, of organizations like the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, they just use the word a person. They don't distinguish between a human legal person and a non-human legal person. And so I thought, well, hang on. If the whole idea that the company is a thing to buy and sell is legally a myth, it's not actually in law that the company is a thing to buy and sell. Rather, the law treats the company as a legal person where everybody has a contractual relationship with that person. So a company is a nexus of contracts as much as it's a community then how come we can treat the company as property? How come we think we can buy and sell it? Oh, right. It's back to apartheid. It's because we 
give all of the voting rights just to that narrow group of people that have money to invest. And then we tie together in an inseparable way how much voting power you have to how much money you've put in. And so at the heart of what we've been building from um, seven or eight years now are companies based on a commons concept, treating the company as a free, conscious living entity that if it's fully able to express its full potential, can do a huge amount that is net positive, that is regenerating all of the capitals that life needs to thrive. And you know the, the necessary step for that to work is to really take seriously the company as a person and to include all stakeholders in governance, that the company itself is conscious and therefore has the freedom to choose how to act properly. And what that means is as in nature, you know, if you think of a valley in nature, all the different plants, animals, and fungi in some emergent sense have governance power over how the ecosystem of the valley unfolds. And the same needs to be true in a company. We need to have all of the capitals and stakeholders inside the company in some kind of an argument so that the intelligence can emerge and so the company can truly do what is there too. The neat part of this, and I'll close on this bit, is once you start putting this into practice, which we've been doing ourselves and with our clients for a number of years now, it's actually really, really practical because there's nothing that the staff, the customers, the suppliers want more than what they're involved in to really succeed. And if you can really contribute to the success of the whole, you do so. So it just eliminates so much of the friction we have today. Yeah, that's very beautifully put that um, that's true, that nature, every little particle in nature has some agency um, and governance rights over the entire ecosystem. And there is this easy complexity that is evolving and co-generating. And it's just, and we're also part of that same nature. Um, and so whatever we are creating, which is essentially companies in, in this context, has the power to be those kind of um, cells within the larger organism uh, kind of a model. Um, I wonder if you could share an example of an organization that uh, in the real world is able to function in this way in part or whole. Yes. So there are various organizations that either have part of this or all of this. You know, clearly, there are the um, you know, ourselves, Evolute 6, we're incorporated this way, we're structured this way, we've been functioning this way now for, what, it's six or seven years since we incorporated specifically as a venture studio for this kind of company. And then we have various companies that uh, were either part of the early development or that we've been developing uh, over the past few years. And they range from, on the one hand, a company Solve Earth that runs hackathons and various other programs to support people on their journey from whatever they're doing now to building businesses and working in businesses that are net positive, regenerative, and solve the Earth's problems. Through to, at the other end, one of our clients, they're not yet fully incorporated, uh, in Canada, and they're working on the two clients in Canada. One of them is working on hard tech incubation and acceleration, the kinds of hard technology 
products and the businesses around them that are necessary to get us from an extractive economy into a regenerative economy. And another company in Canada that is well on the way to incorporating this way is looking at the entire housing construction sector, which is very extractive. You know, concrete is one of the primary sources of CO2 emissions. So again, they're working on, first of all, getting that close to net zero, as close as possible, and then subsequent steps, getting it to net zero, and then beyond that to net positive. Yeah, And then, so in Sweden, there's a company that took inspiration from our Fair Shares Commons, built a company that has, well, basically it is a Fair Shares Commons, their, their way of building. Oh, and as a side comment, the Fair Shares Commons is not one way of incorporating, it's a pattern language. So it's we've demonstrated that you can build fair shares commons companies in pretty much any country in the world. You It might not be one monolithic company, you might do it with two or three interlocking mixtures of a cooperative, a trust and a LLC, for instance. Um, so the Canadian group did it that way. Then another company that is now actively seeking investors is a Fair Shares Commons DAO. So a decentralized autonomous organization. The Fair Shares Commons is perfect for both the DAO and the incorporation. And you can build a mirror image Fair Shares Commons in company law and on the blockchain as a DAO, giving you the best of both worlds. Mm. Which is what this DAO is doing. And this is um sort of interject and ask you maybe to just explain a little bit about uh what the fair share commons really means in the context of a company yes so fair shares commons is relatively simple to build anywhere in the world it's a way of incorporating where you have different classes of shares for each of the capitals and stakeholders. So in some sense, it's simply a hack of existing cooperative and limited company structures to give you all of the power. So it's a combination of a range of stakeholders for all of, a range of shares for all of the stakeholders, including a specific set of shares for the stewards. And the stewards might have anywhere between 30 to 80% of the voting power, potentially even 100%. And then you would have a Fair Shares Commons trust. And that's mm -hmm. part of the power of the Fair Shares Commons. You can dial it up or down the various elements to give you exactly what you want. There's a huge degree of flexibility. But the stewards are critical. And then the Fair Shares Commons is not only having the purpose anchored in its constitution or articles of incorporation, but the purpose is itself anchored in what was the external context and need that required that company to exist. So kind of like nature, it's not saying this is the purpose of the lion. It's saying this is what the savanna is like at the moment, this is the need that the savannah has for the functionality of a lion, which results in the purpose of a lion. And the power of that for a regenerative economy, for all of these things, is it makes really clear at the point this company was incorporated, why was it incorporated? And immediately that why changes it becomes visible and you can you immediately change the purpose to match. And this addresses what's sometimes called the evolutionary purpose of a company. If it's a conscious company, it needs to evolve. Its purpose is evolving. And for something to evolve, the connection with the environment has to be really clear and visible so that it can evolve. And then the Fair Shares Commons has a number of other things in it. So 
One of them, for example, is typically intellectual property is treated as a commons. It might be a closed commons just within the company and its broader ecosystem. Things like voting governance is distributed across all stakeholders appropriately, but also any profit in any of the capitals is distributed across all of the stakeholders. So now the Fair Shares Commons does something really powerful. If the company does deliver financial profit at the end of the year, let's say because a huge number of um, participants engaged in an IT platform and their human capital led to a growth in the financial capital wealth of the company, all of these people get a share of that financial wealth. Had Facebook, LinkedIn, Google been built as a fair shares commons, a significant part of that wealth would be distributed across all of the people who have been part of building the success of those companies. And that would that's a superbly powerful way of addressing this systemic injustice and correcting for the bias towards extractive capitalism. Well, wow, that really, um, that's a, that's a great way to explain it actually, where, you know, you're right. It's, it's, it's absolutely the consumer, the workers, the, the people who support it in different ways that actually leads to the success of a company and its profits finally. And if we were to reimagine that as everybody getting a part of it, then the well-being of everybody is uh, important as well. Uh, and so is the entire planet as well, because if we're talking about well-being, then there is no well-being of anybody unless the planet's well-being is also taken care of. Um, so that's a very powerful way to uh, understand uh, the purpose of a company being the force. And I want to actually talk about, you, you said about the evolution and that if the purpose changes or the purpose ceases to be relevant anymore in the context of a company or an institution or an organization, then to come together to regroup and rethink the purpose or decide that this is not a company that is needed anymore. Death is a big part of nature. And when one being dies, it completes the cycle. But it also contributes to many other cycles of life. And that's the way nature exists. Um, and I read that this concept of evolution and uh, of, of death in this context of a company is a part of your thought process. So I'd love for you to speak a little bit more about that. Absolutely. This is the power of, in the constitution of the company, anchoring the purpose in the external context and need as soon as the external context and need, in other words, the environmental niche in the economy for that company, as soon as that has changed, the company may, not, may no longer be needed. Uh, the niche may disappear and then the company needs to collapse. Equally, the, a, a fair shares commons, we could build we could have built a fair shares commons on a piece of paper around this interview. And it would only last from when we first started talking about doing this interview to the end of the interview. And then it would just disappear because there's no need for it anymore. So the fair shares commons is designed to be a way of convening. Think of it this way. It's a structured container and set of interactions to convene all of the stakeholders and the capitals involved in some endeavor for however long that endeavor needs to last. It might be like a fruit fly. It lasts for a day. It might be like a sequoia. It can last for thousands of years. Uh, it might even be like an entire valley's ecosystem that has multiple fair shares common species inside it and where the valley's ecosystem lasts for eons, millions of years. It, it can be anything across that entire range. And that gives the secret, the magic ingredient. Part of the reason why we have 
such an extractive economy. And this is what Jack, my co-author, and I address in our latest book, The Ergodic Investor and Entrepreneur, is because we haven't understood the actual nature of how capital changes in an unpredictable world. And the consequence of that is that compared to nature, which has understood it and does not waste anything, the way we build businesses is incredibly wasteful. And by wasting so much, we need to extract 10 times more just to stay afloat. And so at the heart of not wasting is, first of all, the recognition of how unpredictable everything is in life. There are consequences of that. And secondly, it absolutely means that we recognize when it's the right time for something to die, and we enable it to die gracefully in such a way that all of the all of the capitals that is built up, relationship capital, intellectual capital, et cetera, et cetera, stay in the ecosystem and can be used for the next, the next companies that emerge. And so that's really at the heart of it. And in, in some senses, um, what post-growth means for me is not that profit, growth, et cetera, gets shut down. It's far more that we start working the way nature works, where growth is used to increase the capacity of everything to carry life, and there are the appropriate processes of decay, composting, death, to, to really keep everything in a dynamic balance that is net positive. Well, that was really, really profound, the idea of graceful depth in um in the business world and it is um it's so valuable to to be comfortable with such a concept um as an entrepreneur um or as a leader in in any field today is there's a lot of courage that is required when to accept that the purpose of something is over and you need to let it die a graceful death and that is something that, as you were saying, that what you know it reminded me of is where you know the fossil fuel companies are today, and it, it, there could be an argument that at some point in time it was maybe needed, but then it's come to a point where it is so extractive and it's it needs to it needs to die a graceful death, but instead of transforming into other forms of using the same thing, but then but then selling other ideas. And, and, and that's sort of, to me, the idea of graceful death is missing when something, the purpose is over. How do we, how do we do it in a way that allows other things to, or other or purposes to thrive and flourish um, as, as this entity is sort of bidding farewell. Um, and the, on a sort of slightly related yet unrelated note, I want to just uh, pick on the idea of of stewards. Again, it's something that you mentioned. You mentioned that the next seven generations is a stakeholder as well. Um, and I want to explore that a little bit. How do we uh, how do we incorporate the idea of stewardship uh, about care uh, about the mindset of caretaking for future generations is an integral part of business. How do we incorporate that into, um, into a running business, for example? Um, how, how can that, because all of these things that we're talking about right now is really about mindset. It's a lot of awareness to understand that this is where the world is. These are the various reasons why we are at this point and it is almost it is pretty much undeniable that the system is not working for the vast majority of beings not just human beings but all beings and vast majority of human beings as well so then you know even the system needs to maybe die a graceful death 
and allow for a new system to flourish, right? And and so I, I'm just wondering, like, when you're talking about caretaking for future generations, um, this mindset is really important, but how do we also make it a very practical component? Yes. That, you know, that's key. Nothing that we're talking about is worth talking about unless we can actually do it in practice. And that, that's been at the heart of my approach or pretty much all of my life. You know, yes, I want to find out how things work so that I can do it properly in practice. And all of my exploration of what is a company and is the way we build a company able to truly express the essence of what a company is, that was all about, okay, then so that I can build companies that will really work. So if we take the next seven generations, first of all, by seeing the company as a commons, you know, a commons is visibly something that nobody owns. And if I'm benefiting from a commons at the moment, my obligation is to make sure that the commons is at least equally able to provide that benefit to the next generations. And ideally, I increase that benefit. So this is things like, for example, one of the stewards is a bit like some traditions have the, the concept that before you go off and do something really big that requires perhaps six months of planning and preparation, somebody has the task of doing nothing other than remember why you're doing it so that people don't get lost. So there'll be one of the stewards who is really there to do nothing other than keep clarity on the company as a commons and why it exists. The steward looking at the next seven generations needs to be somebody who has both some level of ability to read into the needs of the next seven generations, humanity as a whole, and the, the requirement to speak clearly with that voice. And that's what's mandated in the Constitution, that the person who has that steward role is required to speak clearly in defense of that voice. And this is now where the balance of power comes in. We, we can't do this with idealism. Obviously, that steward is a human being. Obviously, they're not going to do it imperfectly. Sometimes you may even have a malevolent steward coming in. And that's where, by laying out these stewardship principles clearly in the Articles of Incorporation in the Constitution, along with the ability to remove a steward, everybody also has the obligation to think about the next seven generations, to think about the planet, to think about the community they're from, and to, as best they can, represent that voice as well as the voice of the stakeholder group, the capital that they're representing. And this means, hey, we're in a world that is highly uncertain, unpredictable. Most of the time, we're dealing with things that that are emergent, so we only know what was the right decision after we took the decision, and maybe we never know what the right decision is. So at the heart of the Fair Shares Commons, to make it work in practice, is it has a lot in common with things like deep democracy, for example, and some of these traditions that no voice gets lost, no opinion can dominate over another opinion for systemic reasons, but nor do you slow down in a kind of a frozen state because nobody can come to an agreement. You have this balance between moving forwards at the speed required by the rate of change of the world you're in, and we don't have that in business today. We cannot move fast in business because everything is anchored in the interests of money. So move fast and 
take into account as best you can whilst moving at the speed of change the different needs and interests of all of the stakeholder groups. And yeah, in a sense, how it works in practice is you have everybody inside the tent fighting with each other rather than most of the people outside the tent going through courts of law, which is really slow. Wow, that is just really powerful and valuable information. Thank you for sharing. I'm just, uh, I, I really see how it can be a very uh, implementable, pragmatic way of doing things, of having, you know, in the way, the way, for example, how an environmentalist is like, fighting for something outside, but having an equal, instead of that, having an equal say or and sit around the table and discuss so that you can come up to a win-win solution that benefits all. Um, and uh, the idea of stewardships, like I'm just thinking, oh my God, every company should have stewards that, that represent the voices of, of all entities and living and non and officially considered non-living beings, right? All beings, because you know, many indigenous cultures um across the world talk of mountains being living beings and the earth mm-hmm. being the soil being living. Um so how can all these, I just, that's just really a very, very powerful way to relook at um, business and, um, and a way to change the system from within. And this would be, you know, a, a great way to uh, make it an insider, make all of these concerns insider concerns rather than constantly be overpowering and fighting them as outsider concerns. On that note, I want to ask you about your book, uh, The Orgodic Investor and Entrepreneur. It is such an intriguing name and I'm so curious. So the word ergodic is a word that many physicists and mathematicians are very familiar with, but almost nobody else knows of it. What it means, I can give you a very simple example. Let's say that the entire economy was constrained to work on a chessboard, eight by eight, 64 squares, and you would toss dice and depending on how the dice landed, you would either move you know, forwards, backwards, or diagonally. You have two possibilities. Either the way you move touches every single square equally often over a long enough time period. And then let's say each square is going to either be some kind of success and it increases the bank balance of the company or some kind of cost and it decreases the bank balance. So you have two possibilities. Either when you move through time, square by square by square, you change, you end up touching all of the squares equally often, or you have some kind of constraint and you can't touch all of the squares. For example, maybe you're you're only able to move up and down in a single row on the chessboard. Economics, what we're taught in business schools, is based on the assumption that businesses, if you keep, if you keep going for long enough, a business will eventually touch all of the squares on the chessboard. And so the expected outcome is the average of all 64 squares. That's not how life works. That's not how business works. Life is dependent, critically dependent on the path that follows, critically dependent on the context. It's as if a business on the chessboard can only move up and down a single row. It can only touch the the eight squares on that row. It can't touch any of the others. And so the expected outcome is completely different to the average. In mathematics, a system is ergodic. If when you keep going long enough along a path, you'll end up touching all of the squares. And it's not ergodic if the longer you keep going, the more you're just going to have the same squares. You're not going to touch all of them. Mm -hmm. Now, 
This is huge. First of all, this is one of the reasons why we have systemic injustices in human society that we don't, that most people don't understand why they are systemic injustices. If we think of life, each of us is moving through life on a path. So it doesn't matter if we right now have equality. What matters is, did we have equality across our entire life path up until now? And in fact, if you think of the traditional wisdom of seven generations, well, actually, for you and me to have equality now, we needed to have equality over the entire life paths of the previous seven generations. So, you know, this, this whole question of is life ergodic or not ergodic? Is it a path and everything is dependent on the details of the path you follow or not is huge. Um, what that means in business, our business strategies are built on the assumption that business is ergodic. And it is not. We need very different strategies if business is ergodic. And what it means is we need to start using the strategies that nature uses. We need to think of business not as isolated, independent businesses, but we need to think of entire ecosystems of businesses, that investment is investment into the entire ecosystem, the way that nature invests energy and soil and all of those other things in the entire valley, not into separate plants and animals. And secondly, we need to build businesses that don't purely compete, 100% pure competition, but instead they do an appropriate level of resource sharing. So at its minimum level, to maximize the effectiveness of a business ecosystem, all of the businesses in that ecosystem need to put a percentage of their profit into a common pool that is distributed out to all of the businesses in that ecosystem. And this is exactly how nature operates. It has this kind of profit pooling, where in nature profit is profit in all of the capitals that life needs to thrive. And so that's the essence of what the ergodic investor is. And one of the leading um, actors in the regenerative movement, John Fullerton from the Capital Institute, former um, managing director of JP Morgan, we have a quotation from him on the front cover where he says, a godic thinking shines a light on the path to a prosperous future. And you know, that's, that's really what this is about. The reason why business is so extractive is partly because we build businesses in a ways that are contrary to how all of the capitals change over time. And because of that, we have to extract far more to correct for the lossiness we built in. It's just, um, you said it is released last week, right? Uh, if I, if I'm, yeah, so that's so exciting. Um, I can't wait to read it. In fact, uh, it sounds like it's pretty much a guidebook of how to think about business and may, how to think about business as a way to really magnify impact across the planet, across uh, life forms. I'm just really struck by how you draw so deeply from natural systems. Your process really involves looking at complexity that naturally exists and bringing that into organizations we create. It certainly is a game-changing concept for us to understand um, that businesses can involve that level of complexity. It's not only possible, but the but it in fact thrives. Adapting, evolving, creating at every step of the way. Um, and that's really, that is really how nature functions as well. And you go far beyond the theory and have frameworks and practical steps that an organization can take to transition successfully. We're a part of nature. And for us to thrive, we need systems that are supporting life in, in the truest sense. 
So um, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, sharing that wisdom and and some of those steps that uh, that can really help this transformation. We're almost at time, but before that, I want to ask you if you you have any any um, last thoughts about that you want to share on this podcast. Any any advice maybe for somebody uh, who has a business or wants to start a business but wants to take a more holistic regenerative approach in setting up the business itself yes so i'll give four pieces of advice um the first piece of advice is to really think through clearly if you think of the company as a tool for convening. What does, what does that tool need to convene for this endeavor to really be able to perfectly express what is there to express? Yeah, and in many cases, that will be a multi-stakeholder fair shares commons is the tool needed. Secondly, you want to bring people together to actually do the work. So what is the organization design that will maximally enable everybody to work together effectively and efficiently? And that's where we're very fond of sociocracy and the other variants and sociocracy for all. SOFR is a good place to get resources there. The third tip is to actually do the work, you need real life human beings. And real life human beings are complex, messy. Um, they spend some of their time unhappy and some of their time really happy. And many of the traditions recognize that each of us experiences our own unique internal reality. None of us experiences the same objective external actuality. And many of the tensions and conflicts in human society are because the reality that you experience internally is not the same as the reality I experience, but we try to talk to each other as if your reality is the same as mine. And so the third tip is to build in really powerful processes that help people first share their internal reality and then try to talk about what they're talking about. That eliminates some conflict and it turns other conflict and tension into, well, how do we grow as human beings? So that third tip is to see an organization as a space for human development, not just a space for work. And if you integrate all three of these together, all three of them are about convening different aspects of what we need to bring together to, for a business to work. And they're all about recognizing unpredictability, the inherent messiness, the necessity of tension and conflict being there, and how do we use tension and conflict for strength. And the final tip is to really take seriously that the business is not viable in isolation. I don't even believe that we can build a net positive economy where each individual business is net positive. The third tip is to really think, what are the other businesses that need to flourish around you? And to figure out a way of building all of the businesses, either simultaneously or close enough together, and to treat that as an ecosystem. All of you need to thrive for any of you to thrive. And it is actually about convening ecosystems of businesses, not convening an individual business. Yeah, that would be my third tip. And of course, you know, this is what I've been writing about in The Ergodic Investor and Entrepreneur and what I've been writing about in Rebuild the Economy, Leadership, and You. So the tips are gone into in much more detail in those two books. And if, you know, if, if anybody wants 
more support on that journey, well, the, the programs in the Evolute 6 uh, Venture Studio are there to support people who want to do it with others rather than themselves. So one last thought I wanted to put in, which is if we think of this through the lens of everything I'm talking about is a way of convening, then the question comes, at what point do we stop convening? Who should we include? And so if we think of what could a fair shares ecosystem look like in the clothing sector, you would have an entire spread from all the way from, let's take cotton, all the way from the farmers at the beginning who are growing the cotton through the, the harvesting, the employees that work on the harvesting, through the refining or preparing of the cotton, the treating of the cotton, through to manufacturing the cloth, through to turning the cloth into garments, through to the department stores or shops that are selling the clothing, through to the, the, uh, the used clothing that is no longer needed that either goes into waste or recycling. All of those would be part of this Fair Shares Commons business ecosystem. And what that means is that the wealth generated at all parts of the chain of the ecosystem are shared across the entire ecosystem. And again, this makes it superbly powerful at really recognizing that no part of the chain is viable without all of the chain, without all of the ecosystem, and that the wealth generated in one part of the ecosystem that maybe has the direct contact with wealthy people is effectively distributed in a collaborative way across everybody rather than as we have it now, it's done in a competitive way, which makes it easy to extract and exploit. So it's that kind of vision that really drives me and why I'm so vocal about the potential of a commons-based way of building conscious capitalism. Yeah, it, it, that's why I'm so passionate about it. This has been such an insightful and expansive conversation. There is so much information here on where we are and where we need to be and what we need to get from here to there. And the work that you do is so incredible in that it details our practical transitional steps that an organization or an individual um, can take and that can transform our business and investment systems into regenerative, conscious uh, and living systems that support um, the planet and the well-being of of all that um, that is a part of this planet. I want to thank you for sharing so generously and explaining it all in very simple uh, terms. And I th thank you for being on this podcast. It was such a pleasure to host you. Thank you very much, Nisha, as well. It's been an absolute joy talking to you. And I, I've really enjoyed the dynamic of our interaction. Do you want to also just share how someone can get in touch with you if they want to or in touch with your organization? Yes, the, the best way to get in touch with us is to go to the either the Evolute 6 website, which is evolute6.com, and you can get in touch with us via that. There's also some material on my personal website, graham-boy.biz. All of my blogs going back years are on there, various other material. And I think that's probably the best way of getting in touch with me. Yeah, of course, I'm. You know, if anybody wants to follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter, you're more than welcome to seek me out there. I'm also on Mastodon um, as, as well. So, yeah, those are the best places to reach out to me. I'm so glad to hear that. And with that, um, we'll come to an end of our of this podcast. This is Regional Rising's podcast, Elevating Stories, Activating Change. I am your host, Nisha Mary Paulos, Executive Director of Regenerative Rising. And with me today is Graham Boyd, CEO and founder of Evolute 6.